for five of the last nine years, I've chosen to do my continuing education at something called the Festival of Homiletics, uh, which is also known as Woodstock for Preachers. <laughs> It's a Monday through Friday conference, and it features the best preachers and professors and minds, really, thinkers, all day long, every day, with the finest local musicians to boot. At host churches, the organists and the choirs are forewarned that their sanctuaries will be filled, and the attendees will know all of the hymns, and we won't be afraid to sing out. At one such venue a couple years ago, an organist dropped out on the hymn and suddenly 1,800 voices were heard singing more or less four-part harmony, uh, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. He, he later admitted that he didn't want to come back in to play the final verse as he had never heard such a sound in his church before. It's really quite remarkable. Last year I asked uh, Carl if he would like to join me. He looked at the outline of three worship services a day with two lectures and a concert, all kicked off by the Lutheran men's chorus, and he said, knock yourself out. <laughs> he later amended his no thanks to, I'm sure this is something you will really enjoy doing with your friends. <laughs> and I do. I'm with my people. This year, over 1,200 progressive pastors from all of our mainline churches met together in Atlanta for the week. We speak a common language and we come together to be fed and nourished. There are no six degrees of separation because we all know friends through colleagues and we get right down to our people in, co uh, in common right away. The, the church, in the church, we know who our people are. And so that is my theme today, and you can't argue that today's scripture is about knowing who one's people are. <laughs> and uh, Joni, you did a great job again on that. I'm fairly certain that this passage is not going to be read again anytime soon. Um, a Catholic priest preaching at the event said that this, this passage comes up just before Christmas, and he said, we have to deal with it, and you Protestants don't. So my challenge for you is to go back and preach a sermon on the genealogy from Matthew. Who are your people? Author Ann Weems is reminded of the time that she was in Wisconsin leading a worship service at a conference. Before supper that night, a man with a southern accent came up to her and asked, where are you from? When she said Nashville, he smiled and he said, I knew that. Who are your people? <laughs> Anne recalls that a surge of memories swept over her. She saw faces and names and even smelled some of the sweet aromas associated with home. She had answered the question, before, once when she went away to college in Memphis, and then when she married and changed her name. She writes, I knew what it meant. To whom do you belong? It is an ancient question. It is a means of identification, of claiming ties. It can instantly open doors or shut them in your face. My father is Tom Barr. Anne replied. His face lit up with a look of recognition. He told the people with him, she's one of us, she's Tom Barr's daughter, and so they gathered around her and they led her to their table, talking about the people that they knew 25 years ago in Nashville. We dashed back in time and it felt right, Anne recalled. I belonged, I was accepted, I know who my people are. On this Memorial Day weekend, we pause to remember those who gave their lives in service to our country. These two are our people, held up for praise and honor in a long line of servicemen and servicewomen that traces back through our history. Musician Eric Burden once said, there were also those who came out of the trenches as writers and poets who started preaching peace, men and women who have made this world a kinder place to live. 
The genealogy in the Gospel of Matthew has a purpose, of course. It is important for the community of Matthew to bring Jesus' line back to King David and then further back even to Abraham. And this is the community now that's residing in Jerusalem, and the Gospel is even called the Jewish Gospel. The individuals who are mentioned were imperfect people. Some on the family tree are relatively unknown to us. And I could have used the other genealogy. There's another one in Luke, you know. It's, it's one that places Joseph's heritage through Mary's father, and it goes back, back way, all the way back to Adam, in fact. But in Matthew's, there's something unusual. Women, four of them, all with colorful pasts. They're linked in a straight line, showing how Jesus was a descendant from King David and back to Abraham. One might not think of some of these people being a part of a proper lineage for Jesus. They go from prostitutes to seductresses. And they might make a great cast list for a reality show called Real Housewives of Jerusalem. <laughs> Except that these women may have Gentile origins. Rahab was a prostitute in Canaan. Bathsheba was married to a Hittite. Ruth resided in Moab, and Tamar had a name of Hebrew origin. The women's nationalities are not necessarily mentioned. The suggestion is that Matthew may be preparing the reader for the inclusion of more people, the inclusion in this case of Gentiles in Jesus' mission. There's an apparent element of scandal. Rahab was a prostitute. Tamar posed as a prostitute to seduce Judah. Bathsheba, she was an adulteress. And Ruth is sometimes seen as seducing Judah. Uh, Boaz, excuse me. Perhaps all of this, their, their unusual, even scandalous unions, is to prepare the reader for what will be said about Mary. And then there's another piece to who are Jesus' people. It's mentioned almost in passing that Jesus had brothers and sisters, and we can see that he is at least one of seven siblings. His four brothers are mentioned in the Bible, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and in the same accounts in Matthew 13 and Mark 6, it says, and his sisters, plural, meaning he had to have had at least two sisters. You know, one would think that if you were Jesus' sister, you might mention, you might have your name mentioned in the Bible, don't you? I, I, but it's another example of the times in which they lived and the importance now today of inclusive language and theology so that sexism isn't perpetuated through our primary text. There's been some discussion through the centuries as to the exact relationship of these men and women to Jesus. There are three basic views. The first is that they were siblings from Joseph's previous marriage. The second was that Jesus was the firstborn son of Mary, and the rest came later. And the third is the factuality of the virgin birth really just isn't that important. There's a lot here, though, about who Jesus' people are. Here he is amidst our messiness, and here he is amidst our hurt in our joy and in our pain, both the pain we feel and the pain that we inflict upon others. Catholic priest and preacher Michael Renninger spoke to 1,200 Protestant preachers not too many days ago, and he said, our churches are filled with the right kind of people. They are most likely polished and they are poised. And he says, in addition to these wonderful people, who would Christ want in our pews? Do we have the courage in this day and age to build a church that might exist for the wrong kind of people? Or perhaps at one time were we considered the wrong kind of people? He quoted Pope Francis who said, I prefer a church that is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. The Pope also said, more than by fear of going astray, my hope is that we will be moved by the fear of remaining shut up within structures which give us a false sense of security, within rules that make us harsh judges, within habits which make us feel safe, while at our door are starving people, and Jesus does not tire of saying to us, give them something to eat. 
Who are your people? I suspect that many of you know an answer to that. I think for many folks it's, it could be that you belong to people right here in this room, or at least as much as you let them in, polished and poised, or confused and contrarian. Your pedigree does not matter. Rahab and Bathsheba stand in a line of saints from Abraham to Jesus. This is where we are fed. This is where we are nourished. It is where we are at our very best. And sometimes, painfully, it is the place where we are not so much. Maybe you can even think you are the wrong kind of person for the church. But here's what I know to be true, that this is the place where you get the glue that helps you to stick simply by walking through the doors and letting yourself be open and vulnerable, stepping in, daring even to volunteer. Community happens. Who are your people? We are constituted so that simple acts of kindness such as giving to a cause or doing the walk or celebrating inclusion or simply expressing gratitude have a positive effect on our long-term moods and personality. Paul Bloom says the key to the happy life, it seems, is the good life with sustained relationships, challenging work, and connections to community. Church isn't where you meet. Church is what you do. Church is who you are. Church is the human outworking of the person of Jesus Christ and his example. We don't go to church. We are the church. And Ann Weems once recalled, I belonged. I was accepted. I know who my people are. And so do we. Amen. Let's rise and sing our closing hallelujah.